Okay, about a year and a half ago, I was in Washington. We were launching the book that I'm going to talk about tonight, um, Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. And I've noticed a lot of scrum people are not getting twice the work done in half the time. So uh, one, our whole approach to training, and uh, we're not doing any training right now in Washington, but uh, New York's not that far away. Uh, I do most of my training in Boston or Europe right now. Uh, I have two trainers who are, one's a fifth degree black, black belt kung fu expert, and another one is beyond the belts. He's been the Tai Chi champion of the United States for many years, okay? And so we, we teach a style of scrum that is guaranteed to get you twice the work in half the time. And if you don't get it, you get your money back for the course. So you can't beat that. We also, uh, in May of this year, just a couple of months ago, finally got another paper on Scrum into the Harvard Business Review, the first paper in 30 years since the original Scrum paper in 1986. And it's really a good paper for managers, uh, embracing Agile, all the things that managers uh, can do to help and all the things they do that, that tends to block agility that they need to fix. So if you have any management problems, it's a good place to start. I'm working more and more with leadership in the last month uh, we've been training the, the senior management at Toyota, uh, the senior management at GE Digital, GE Power particularly, I've been working with that are building the power plants. Last week I was at Maersk, which is the number one shipping company in the world. They need to get agile. So Scrum is moving way beyond software. For all these companies, software is a part of what they do, but it's not the main business. It's building stuff, shipping stuff, making cars, uh, Scrum is really, uh, it's interesting what happened, what's happening. I've done a lot of work recently also with the guys that wrote the book on Agile Innovation. And uh, we did a webinar with them, and here's one of the slides they had in the webinar. They said, hey, Jeff, have you noticed that global poverty has gone down, well, here in 2011, is down to 17%. Actually, I've got more recent data because the World Bank called us up uh, about a month ago, and they said, we've got a problem. Uh, world poverty is going down below, it went below 10% in 2015. It looks like it's going to zero, at least the extreme poverty that we measure. And we're gonna have to cha change our whole business model at the World Bank. Should we, should we use Scrum to run the World Bank? And of course, we said, well, yeah. And they said, so they said, come on down. Uh, my son, the co-author of the book, lives here in Washington, so he went down to the World Bank headquarters. We're talking about how do we take poverty to zero, but once you do that, then you start to need to build economies, okay? So how would you use Scrum to that? Uh, the innovation guy said also, if you look at global productivity, uh, you know, global productivity has doubled. And if you look at uh, how much people are working, people are working less. So kind of worldwide, we're already doing twice the work in half the time. But I just downloaded a, a most recent book today on productivity in the United States, and uh, we got a little bump during the dot-com era, but in recent years in the United States, we've kind of flatlined. Most of this productivity increase is coming from <laughs> somewhere else right now. So if you really look at what the work situation uh, here, we need to talk about that. One of the things the innovation guy says is driving this is computing. We know Moore's law says our, our com computer, the number of transistors on a chip doubles every 18 months. So our computers get faster, cheaper. Communication is even faster doubling, doubling every nine months. Storage every 12 months. And content exponentially exploding. And it's driving everything down in price to 95. 95% of the price is getting driven out of out of, out of things. And uh, that's one of the things that's really not only helping with poverty, but it's also changing the business. So we have these situations like Nokia being number one in 2007, and then with 60% market share, and then in four years later, zero. <laughs> that's why all these big companies are talking to us. It doesn't matter if you're number one anymore. 
in four years, you could be dead. So, uh, and, we're, and we're doing a lot of work with the car people in Germany. And, uh, you know, last year, Tesla went up 50% in market share, and all the competitors went down. So we have guys from Mercedes, Volkswagen, in the classes. I say, okay, if you, last year you went down 20%. If that happens five years in a row, you're just like Nokia, right? I said, I hope the alarm bells are going off in Stuttgart. They said, yes, they are. Okay, yes, they are. So it's really interesting what's happening. Let's come back to the United States. Here's a survey that the New York Times did last year about why people hate work. You know, most people, I think it's a little better in software, but most people, they never have time to do what they want. They can't focus. They, don't have, no, they, they, they have no creative time. They, they don't have any connection to the mission of the organization. And the Gallup polling does a real-time survey. You can go online and you can see, okay, today, how many people were engaged at work? And it's always down around 30%. 70% of the people working, they just want to get out of there. And, and, and surveys have shown between 15 and 20% are actively trying to sabotage the, the, the organization they're in because they just hate it so bad. So, so it's not pretty out there. And uh, my assessment of the problem is that because people have a hard time getting things done, then the managers start putting pressure on people. And in software, historically, you know, we've had to work nights, we've had to work weekends, we've gone on death marches. It's been a life of misery, right? A lot of you are nodding right now, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that's not fun, and it's because we can't get stuff done. Okay. So if we could figure out a way to get stuff done more effectively, faster, easier, have more fun doing it, it could really change our, our lives. And for, I know for many of you in this room, your life has been changed significantly by Scrum, by moving to Scrum. Well, I started back at West Point as a cadet. Uh, this is Beast Barracks. Uh, here's Barry, uh, four-star general Barry McCaffrey standing next to me. He's reti just, he retired recently. Uh, he was in my squad at Beast Barracks, and we're in a shower formation. Before we could go to bed at night, we had to take a shower. Before we could take a shower, we had to stand rigidly at attention until we drenched our bathrobe with sweat. And only when our bathrobe was drenched could we get in the shower. So I had to learn how to do, generate twice the sweat and half the time. <laughs> you know, there's another guy that's been doing this guy, stuff like this, a guy named Ferris that wrote a couple of books. One is The Four-Hour Work Week, the other is The Four-Hour Body. You read that? The thing I liked the most in The Four-Hour Body, he said, you know, we're trying to get you know, more, more muscle, less fat, burn calories, and they're studying the Olympic swimmers. And these guys, they eat 12,000 calories a day and lose weight. And they measured the amount of output that, that they were generating for exercise, and the exercise would only burn a few thousand calories. So they said, what's burning those other 8,000 calories? And they figured out it's the cold water. They're in that cold water for hours. So Ferris, the author of the book, went down to the Safeway, bought six or eight bags of ice, filled his bathtub with ice, jumped in the bathtub and lay there for half an hour, shivering and shaking in pain <laughs> to see if he could burn 12,000 calories. <laughs> and he, he figured out it, it really works, but it's just extremely painful. <laughs> so he did what I did. <laughs> How could you figure out an easy way? And what he figured out was that if you get a cold pack, you know, you put it in your fridge, put it in your freezer, and you watch, sitting down watching TV at night, for half an hour, you put it at the top of your shoulders and your back, you can get 60% of the effect of lying for a half an hour in a tub of ice. Who would have thought it? No pain, no suffering, no sh It's the easy way, okay? So this is what my scrub book is about. 
We had to learn the hard way, all those death marches, we had to learn the hard way, and now we're showing you how you can do it. It's fun, it's easy, it's more effective, the customers like it better, all these things. But it all starts with pain and suffering in the beginning. <clears throat> I started to dig myself out of that even at West Point. The last year I was at West Point, I was training officer of Company L2, which was known as the worst company in the Corps of Cadets marching on the parade field. And as my job as training officer was to, they called the company the loose deuce. My job was to help to fix that. No matter what we did, marching overtime didn't work, telling them they were bad cadets didn't work. Uh, Finally, out of desperation, I put color-coded notes on the company bulletin board after every parade so we could see in priority order the points that they lost. Everybody had to walk by it after every parade. And without saying anything, the company self-organized into the number one company in the Corps of Cadets within three months, showing that just by making things visible, even really bad teams can become the best in three months. So that was the start of, really, for me, the Agile journey. Right about that time, General MacArthur died, probably our most famous graduate. And he had specified that there would be a company of cadets marching behind his casket when he was buried. And because the loose deuce was number one, we got to bury General MacArthur. So none of us have ever forgot that. He was a legend in our time. Now, here's the thing that comes out of all that that is directly relevant to today. The biggest problem we find when we go into companies, we find out that teams don't have a clear prioritized backlog at the beginning of every sprint. In fact, we see, we go in and they ask, you know, I won't name the companies, but multiple companies have asked us to come in, let's assess 1,000 developers, and we'll find 30% of them are doing stuff that the business does not want them to be doing. The other 70%, you know, we know they're producing 64% of features that are never are really used. <laughs> but 30% are producing stuff that is just pure junk that if anybody knew what they were doing, they'd want them to stop. So how many of you uh, have fixed, fixed this in your organization? Everybody knows the beginning of every iteration, they have a clear prioritized backlog of what to do. Only a couple of people. So that means we have a lot of work to do to get agile. So a lot of our work with, with the larger companies is initially trying to establish a product owner organization that can deliver that backlog and clarify. Because without that, you know, nothing matters that much. <laughs> you know, you can, you can go twice as fast as half the time delivering useless stuff, but that doesn't solve the problem. We really need to get the priority straight. In, a, in addition to General MacArthur having a big impact on us while I was a cadet, I lived in the, I slept in the same bed that General Eisenhower slept in when he was a cadet. In fact, there was a brass plaque on the fireplace saying, General Dwight D. Eisenhower slept here. So I, was wonder, I would wonder what Eisenhower was thinking when he was falling asleep in bed at night. I knew that he had a famous quote was, plans are worthless, planning is everything. So when he planned taking the beaches at Normandy at D-Day, it was one of the biggest planning exercises in the history of the planet. But he knew as soon as the first shot was fired, the teams would have to self-organize to take the beach. The plan would be shattered. And I learned this firsthand. When I graduated, I went into the Air Force. Um, I told them if they made me a fighter pilot, I would go into the Air Force. I wound up flying F-4 Phantom aircraft over North Vietnam. Here's one of my fellow pilots over Hanoi getting shot down by a SAM missile. Here's a missile exploding, sets the airplane on fire. Here he is bailing out. He landed, was captured, uh, thrown into the Hanoi Hilton, which is the prison of war camp. 
uh, escaped, was recaptured, and tortured to death. Now, I did a lot of analysis when I was flying my missions over there. Uh, you know, we had 100 missions to fly to complete a tour. And during those 100 missions, I, I figured out that the people that followed their plan, 80% of them would get shot down. It was, the most, it was the most heavily defended airspace in the history of air warfare. So I figured out how to, as soon as I crossed the border of North Vietnam, I threw the plan away, went into an evasive maneuver every second I was over that airspace. I knew where I needed to be at the right time for a few seconds, but the rest of the time evading. And the people that did that, and the people I trained that did that, only 20% of us get shot down. So on the average, about 50% of the people I flew with got shot down. There's only one other cadet at West Point that flew with me on these missions. He is buried in the West Point Cemetery. Uh, so that taught me a lesson about planning. When I get back, um, it was a surprise to get back alive. I felt, how many play video games? Any video game players in here? Yeah. You know, you're playing a video game, boom, 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 all of a sudden you get blown up. Then you hit the reset button and boom, you've got life number two. <laughs> okay? So I had life number two. And I was determined not to do what I did in life number one. <laughs> I thought that that was really stupid. And uh, maybe a service to my country, but it was really stupid, OK? I would not do that again. So what was I going to do in life number two? I wanted time to think about it. So the Air Force had a program. They'd send guys like me back to school to become a professor at the Air Force Academy to teach cadets. So I said, I want, I want to be in that program. I want to go to Stanford. I want to study math, computer science. And uh, I'll, I'll be a professor of mathematics at the Air Force Academy. So they decided, decided OK, we'll send you there. And uh, I got a lot of time to think. Uh, the, I, I, the courses I liked the best at Stanford were actually in the medical school, using math and statistics to run clinical trials, to run epidemiologic studies, the heart surgeons had a mentality that was very similar uh, to fighter pilots. So I could really relate to them. And uh, I also did a lot of work in AI at, the, uh, at SAIL, the AI uh, lab. At that time, McCarthy, one of the, one of the two co-founders of Artificial Intelligence with Marvin Minsky, who I worked with later, was running the lab. And he was always complaining that I was using 10% of the entire compute power of the AI lab at Stanford, working on my program, a smart program that would play chess and win against people. Uh, so I get to the Air Force Academy. I'm teaching math. And I want to continue my work in my doctoral degree. I don't have my PhD yet. So I decide to do it at the nearest medical school, the University of Colorado Medical School. So nights and weekends, vacations, I'm, I'm continuing my doctoral work. And there I met a very well-known physician, Dr. John Baylor. Uh, he's probably the oldest guy ever to get a MacArthur Award. You know, the MacArthur Award is when they show up with a check at your door, here's a million dollars. It's called the Genius Award. Spend it however you want. He got it when he was 83 years old. When I met him, he uh, had just written this paper uh, showing that there were more women getting cancer induced by radiation from mammography than were getting cured by early detection. And it created a huge uproar. The radiologists wanted to tar and feather him and run him out of the country. Uh, but when I met him, I said, you know, Dr. Baylor, uh, you're a guy who actually does the research, publishes it, stands up for the truth, it will not back down, and people have to read your stuff. And the National Cancer Institute actually had to change all their public policy. At the time, he was the uh, <clears throat> editor of the journal of the National Cancer Institute, a very powerful figure there. 
And he had been the one responsible for all the data collection on cancer for decades at, at the National Cancer Institute. So I said, maybe you could help me write a thesis that'd be worth reading, because most of us, uh, we write a thesis uh, as a doctoral student, and it goes on a library shelf, and it just gathers dust. And uh, we probably got a bunch of PhDs. How many got a PhD in this room? Here at MITRE, we have a lot of them, right? So I said, help me write something that's worth reading. So he said, well, I have a problem. I have a couple of problems, he said, but here's my number one problem. Here's 300 clinical papers. Uh, each paper has a charts and graphs on cancer. Some of them are animals, some are humans, all different types of cancers in all different countries. Every chart and graph is different. Explain why, I'll give you a doctoral degree. He said, oh, well, how will I do that? He said, well, you're going to have to math it. You're a computer science mathematician. You need to mathematically model the human cell and show exactly what transitions it goes through to become a malignant cell. And then what happens to make it grow into a tumor? Because then a patient goes to a clinic, and if they get a diagnosis, it winds up in my database at National Cancer Institute. And so when your model of the cell fits all my data, that's the definition of done. You got a doctoral degree. I said, well, that sounds like a hard problem. He said, yeah, it is. You're going to have to figure out what causes cancer, because nobody agrees. <laughs> but he says, I will help you and all the leading cancer researchers in the world are trying to publish in my journal. I'm talking to all of them all the time. And we will review everything you're doing and guide you. So it sounded like a really unique opportunity, uh, even though impossible. So I went to work. I spent six years in the medical uh, six months in the medical school library studying the literature. Then I started coding. It took six months of coding. I had to do some make some mathematical breakthroughs to get get things to run fast enough. And I finally ran the program for the first time after one year. And when I got back to my office, people kept running in and saying, Sutherland. You just used a third of the computer science budget for the medical school for the year. This was even worse than the AI lab at Stanford. <laughs> so uh, they said you could never run that program again. It, it took me two years to work with the head of the medical computing lab just to get hardware in so that I could actually run the program again. But the program clearly showed that there were four stages of cell uh, changes that cause malignancy. And uh, this is actually recent data from, you know, today we can DNA sequence cells and we can see exactly what changes in the genetics. And so this is current genetic data showing what my program showed before anybody had a clue about any of this. Okay. Now, this turns out to be the fundamental mechanism by which Scrum works. Because that research showed you could take a complex adaptive system, in this case a human cell, it will go through a series of state changes moving through a design space, and it can go into a negative state, maybe get cancer, but you could actually take a cancer cell, and we showed in the lab, whereas you, you, you can make that cell chains back into a good cell systematically. So by manipulating a complex adaptive system through a state space, you can alter the way things work. Now it turns out that a cell is a complex adaptive system, a lung is a complex adaptive system, a human is a complex adaptive system, a team is a complex adaptive system, a company is a complex adaptive system, a country is a complex adaptive system. The Earth is a complex adaptive system. So this applies to anything. If we can figure out the right changes to make in the right sequence, anything can be migrated into anything. And so the whole point about Scrum is to systematically alter the way the team works so that an average team becomes a great team. 
Now, I spent 16 years as a research scientist. And then one day, a big banking company came by and they said, hey, Sutherland, you know, you have a team that working on the same technology we're using in the bank, but you guys have all the knowledge of the medical school, but over at the bank, we have all the money. What if we put the knowledge together with the money? And they made me an offer that my wife couldn't refuse <laughs> as a poor graduate student's wife and a junior professor's wife. And uh, so I wind up at the bank as vice president for advanced systems. I'm charting the future of technology. But meanwhile, I'm looking at what's going on in the bank. They had all kinds of programmers, but the biggest number of programmers were COBOL programmers. Anybody programming in COBOL here? Yeah, we still got a few here at MITRE, huh? I'm in Zurich regularly, and there are still thousands of COBOL programmers in Zurich. And I noticed that their projects were always late. We were running 150 banks, so our customers were the CIOs of the banks, and they were really mean customers, okay? And when our projects were late, they would get really angry. And so I, 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 I noticed that they were using these things called Gantt charts. Uh, this is just a simple one. They, they would fill walls with them, thousands of tasks. And uh, I, I, looked at it, I looked at the charts, and every, char every task had a name and a date on it. So as a mathematician, I, kept, I noticed that if one of these was late, the whole thing would slide to the right. So I calculated, what is the probability for a project to be late using this system? What do you think that is? 0.9999999999. It's going to be late. In fact, I found out just recently I had a student in my training that was getting a master's degree at Boston University in project management, and he was complaining to his professor that it's really hard to make projects not late using the Gantt chart. And the professors at BU were saying, projects using a Gantt chart are always late, 100% of the time. Your job as a project leader is just to track the lateness. <laughs> That's what they're teaching at BU. Well, I had never done any of this stuff. I just looked at it. I was horrified. I, I went into the CEO's office and I said, it is a mess out there. All your projects are late and they're getting later. You know, your managers are having more meetings, more reports, more micromanagement. And it's not making it better. It's making it worse. So he said, well, what should I do? I, I said, why don't you give me the worst business unit in the company, and I'll show you. I'll run an experiment, and we'll, we'll do this you know, cellular evolution thing, and I'll show you how to transform the worst into the best. And I said, I want, I, I, give me the worst unit was the automated telesystems that were rolling out all across North America and Canada at the time. I said, give me the entire team, the whole organization. I want sales, marketing, support, all the engineering, software guys, everyone. We're going to break them down into small teams, about five people each, which is the right size. And every Monday morning, they're going to have a backlog. It's going to be prioritized. I'll get the product marketing guys to come in and make sure it's prioritized by business value. And on Friday afternoon, it will be done. And if it's software, it will be live. I said. I will show them week after week how to execute. And I pulled them all together and I said, I'm going to show you how to play. Project. I'm going to get a pilot. I trained a lot of these guys and they tend to come in high. And if they come in high, they can land in the middle of the runway and go sliding right off the end of the runway into the trees or the buildings, or the water, whatever. It's always bad at the end of the runway. So I've had a number of my colleagues wind up as a, in a big smoking hole at the end of the runway because of this. I said, so we need to show you how to land just like that pilot did. These planes are designed to be slammed on the end of the runway. So all the way down, you're making small changes. So we're going to practice landing every Friday afternoon. I said, I know you're going to have a hard time the first few weeks, but we're going to practice it over and over 
So just like the pilots, you learn how to do it right every time. In less than three months, it was the number one business unit in the bank. Just like the teams, the cadets at West Point. It works every time. It does take a little skillful, agile coaching. It does under take understanding the way complex adaptive systems work. And I said, I'm gonna, we're going to throw away the Gantt chart. I'm going to give you a burn down chart so you can see where you are on the glide path every step of the way. So we added the burn down. Now, it's interesting what's going on. The scrum guide says that it's always said this, and it's also the second principle in the Agile Manifesto. At the end of every sprint, you have a potentially shippable incremental product. The product owner wants to ship it, it can ship. And I've been polling people around the country, and particularly in Silicon Valley, where Every company I'm in has at least 200, a small company has 200 scrum teams. The bigger ones have 1,000 or more. And I pulled all those teams and I found out 80% of them don't have working product at the end of a sprint. Now, that is getting to be really bad news today because the state of the art, you know, people are talking about DevOps. Anybody doing DevOps? DevOps means ops is totally automated. There are no humans in the loop. That's what DevOps means. So that means as soon as someone finishes a story, you hit the button, it, it goes live. You, it, it goes into a rolling wave of live until it's fully live, and it automatically backs itself out if there are problems. And uh, Forrester Research did a poll, 2% of companies polled can release multiple times a day. Is anybody doing that here? Another 2% at least once a day. At HubSpot down the street from where I am in Cambridge, 170 live updates a day on a slow day. That's what some companies are doing. Eight percent once a week, twenty-one percent at least once a month. So, twenty-one, twenty-nine, thirty-one, thirty-three percent of companies today can deploy every sprint cycle, or more often. Another third can deploy at least once every quarter, and a third take more than a quarter. What do you think is going to happen to those third that take more than a quarter to deploy? not going to be pretty because these numbers, every day these numbers are increasing. The numbers that can actually deploy on a daily basis, those numbers are, are going up. So it's like the, 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 the pot is boiling. And so a lot of our trading, we find in Boston now, at least the people come to our training, five to 10% of the people can deploy continuously. So uh, how many of you can deploy continuously here? So down here in Washington, a few of you. So it's a little slower down here in the world of the government, OK? But I understand over the immigration service that they can do it. They got a guy from Silicon Valley in there, and they, OK? So it's possible even right here, right down here in River City in Washington to do it if you got the right leadership. So. <clears throat> These are the key ideas behind Scrum uh, that if you understand them, you can implement Scrum better. What we, what we needed to do by the time it got to, I proto started prototyping this in 83. By 93, I was leading an innovation team building new products that we needed the process to go with the tooling we're building, so we needed to formalize the process. And we did that by pulling in some things that were really helpful. One of them, I mentioned I was working with Oxion. Uh, did I mention that here? Was, uh, no, I, I gave a talk at noon. I talked about this at noon, sorry. Uh, 
Back in the early 90s, I was a, a, the, on the President's Advisory Board of a Accion, a nonprofit that lends hundreds of millions of dollars to people in South America, mostly people who do not have enough money to feed their children. And there are loans, they give them small amounts of money. And the way they do it is they build a team, <clears throat> typically around five people, and they work with each person until everybody has a small business plan. And okay, if we give you $25, what can you do to start a small business? When everybody has a plan, they get the money and then they meet regularly. When everybody pays back the loan, then they loan them another $25 to scale the business. And we're getting amazing results. Women who couldn't feed their kids, within a couple of weeks, they've got enough food. Not only that, they have a little extra money, they can buy clothes. <clears throat> you know, if you don't have food, you don't have clothes. Once you got food, then you can think about clothes. That was important because the, the kids needed clothes to go to school. Once the kids are in school, then the women can scale her business. <clears throat> in six months, she's building a new house. I came back to my day job from one of these meetings at Axion, and I looked at my developers and I said to them, you know, you guys remind me of these people in South America. I mean, you have shoes, but you have no software. Everything's late, you've got too many defects, the customers are screaming, Management is telling you you're bad developers. <clears throat> I said, how long has this been going on? And every single person said it had been going on as long as they were working in software. And I said, do you guys want to live the rest of your life like this? And they said, no. <clears throat> so I said, I think if we tried some things like they're doing at Oxyon, which is based on the Grameen Bank at Bangladesh that, that won the Nobel Prize, you know, the World Bank's given away hundreds of millions of dollars. The Grameen Bank has done more good than the World Bank. That's why they got the Nobel Prize, by giving, you know, 25 euro to a really poor farmer or whatever. They've actually bootstrapped the whole economy. So I said, let's <clears throat> think about our software process the way we think about bootstrapping. <clears throat> I said, also, you know, just before I came to Easel Corporation, where we're formalizing Scrum, I was running an object database company, and five graduate students came down the street from the MIT AI lab. Uh, they said, we're starting this company that came to be called iRobot. <clears throat> They're building these insect-like ro <coughs> robots that have multiple legs. <clears throat> and Professor Brooks, their professor, would come by on Fridays to see how they're doing. and. Um, one Friday, I said, Professor Brooks, these robots are really interesting. Explain to me how they work. He said, well, you know, we've been trying to build a smart system at MIT for 30 years. It's been a total failure. The best we could do is a smart chess program. Now we have Watson, right? He can answer questions, but he can't walk and talk and, and, and get stuff done for us. So he said, I'm taking a radically different approach. This robot has no central processor. Each leg has a chip that can move a leg. Spine has a chip that can coordinate legs. Head has a neural network chip that's blank before you turn it on that figures out what to do. He says, let me show you. He puts the chip in the head, flips the switch. The robot's legs start flapping. It wobbles to its feet. Starts walking around the room, bumping into things. It looks like a baby learning how to walk. But within a couple of minutes, it's, it's running around the room. It's amazing. And he said, yeah, it learns how to walk for the first time every time you turn it on. And that, when he said that, it reminded me of the COBOL programmers I had back at the bank. I said, what if we took those COBOL programmers and gave them some simple rules like the robot, and every day they got together and synchronized their neural networks, maybe they could bootstrap up into a super smart team, super fast. And at the time, I said, do you think it would work, Professor Brooks? He said, I don't know. Why don't you try it? So when I got to Easel, I knew I had my opportunity. Let's give it a shot. Now, at the same time, we needed to deal with three major issues. One was Conway's Law, which says that the structure of the organization will reflect in the code. <clears throat> 
And I had been out there teaching object-oriented design for 10 years. And you know, if you have a hierarchical organization, it is absolutely impossible to get good object design in the code. And that means you wind up with brittle code, code that's hard to maintain, hard to change. And so we needed an organizational structure that was object-oriented. Second, we knew from Fred Brooks back in the IBM 360 operating systems days that if a project was late and you added more people to it, it got later. The more people you have on a project, the more the productivity per person goes down. And in Fred Brooks' classic text, The Mythical Man Month, he explains why, and it's because of the communication pathways. They start exploding. <clears throat> So to control that, we need small teams. We had data that shows if, if a six-person team takes a year to do a project, it takes 10-person team a year and a half to do the same project. We had data from hundreds and hundreds of teams showing that consistently, those are averages. So we knew you could never have a team of 10 people. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have a 50% overrun in your plan immediately. And if you went to 17, it would still take a year and a half. So adding another seven people improves nothing. So for some reason, it is still difficult for some people today to understand that and to believe the data that's been around for 30 years. Because I bet some of you out there have teams that are bigger than the three to nine that say stated in the scrum guide. And that is costing you. You know, I run a company and I tell people, I'm not paying salaries for teams of nine. I don't pay slow teams. So you can do it if you want, but as soon as you go to team of nine, you stop getting paid that week. Because I'm just not going to put up with it. And Funny enough, they always split before they get to nine. <laughs> and what do you think happens to the velocity when they split? I can tell you, this has happened over and over again. It always goes up 30% every time they split. And this year, when we did it, the velocity more than doubled. We brought in some. Uh, we, we brought in the Tai Chi master as a scrum master <laughs> and another really good scrum master. And so we even got a, a bigger effect because of the power of a good scrum master. And finally, working at the bank for many years, I had trained the banking managers in uh, Peter Drucker's work on innovation and entrepreneurship. It's very hard to get innovation in a large corporate enterprise. So. We would have weekly book discussion groups on innovation. And the problem is what Drucker calls the cuckoo effect. If you have something new that happens inside an organization, it's like a foreign bacteria invading your body, then your immune system will come out and crush it. So you know, most innovation gets crushed in that way. So I knew we needed a skunk works just like Lockheed had generated in the California desert to build all the latest technology, everything from the plane that got shot down over Russia, the U-2, to the SR-71, to the first stealth bomber, to stuff that's flying around, around out there that you don't even know about, except the guys that might have, they know about it. The rest of you, if you saw it, you think we're flying saucers. That stuff is built in 10% of the time for 10% of the cost. Why? Because those guys are out there in the desert where no managers can go. They can't even know what they're doing out there. But my problem was I didn't think I could send all the scrum teams to the California desert. How was I going to get a Skunk Works operational in corporate headquarters? And in fact, we had uh, Dal Rigby was the lead author on our Scrum paper in the Harvard Business Review. He's the head of innovation at Bain Consulting. <clears throat> and uh, we selected him because he had already published successfully over a dozen papers in the 
HBR, and he knew all the editors really well. <clears throat> he said this was the hardest paper he ever did for HBR. He said, Jeff, you know, the thing I learned from working with you guys is that Scrum is all about innovation, and it's creating a skunk works in the organization. So Scrum is designed to do this, and to do it, we have this structure of small teams. The best, the, Harvard's done a lot of research on the right team size, and we know it's 4.6. Either four or five people is the best team size. And <clears throat> these small teams are coordinated <coughs> by a scrum of scrums, a virtual team, maybe with some additional people, that's responsible for getting, making sure everything gets all done together by all the teams that are associated with it. And it scales indefinitely. It, you, it's basically an object-oriented organizational structure that's indefinitely scalable. And in fact, Steve Denning keeps on saying that we, sh we should get a Nobel Prize for this. This is, the, this is the genius of Scrum, the ability to scale velocity. And we have multiple case studies showing that Scrum done well can scale linearly across the globe. You double the number of teams, you double production. And when we published the first paper on this, the academic reviewers said, hey, everybody writes about productivity, but no one has ever, before or since, showed you can get linear scalability with anything else other than Scrum. How many hardware guys do we have here that worked on linearly scaling processors on a computer? That is a really hard problem. And uh, the same thing is true. The same problem occurs when you're trying to scale people in organizations. So the third most important thing to Scrum is this organizational structure. And today, we're starting to talk more and more. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about technical debt, you know, bad code out there that, you know, it gets worse and worse as the system's out there longer and longer. It's harder and harder to get anything done. But really realizing today that this is caused by organizational debt. Organizations that are structured in a way. We had a great paper presented this past year with a picture of Skype and the interrelationships between the teams showing why, if they made one line of code change, it took seven months to deploy was because the organizational structure was like a rat's nest. And so we realized that we have to fix this. This is a leadership problem. The leadership of companies and organization have created these rat's nests that make it impossible to get things done. And they need to untangle it. And so every time we start working with the first thing we want, if we're going to work with anyone, is uh, we show them Professor Carter's work at Harvard. You know, he says, the, where he's seen the best success, companies that need some agility, maybe they're a multi-billion dollar waterfall company, but the competition, a new product, is killing them. They need some agility. They need to set up an agile part of the organization, and it's like a different operating system like the Mac OS and the Windows. So if you try to run the Windows on top of the Mac, it's possible, but it runs slow and it looks really weird. Okay? We have some scaling frameworks out there that do that. So you really want to have a separate part of the organization that has agile rules of operating and there needs to be a leadership team that's responsible for making sure those rules are set up properly and the organizational structure is put together in a way that it can be agile. And if the whole company was agile, then this would be the senior management team. But failing that, we need a team that's responsible for making this thing work. Or we won't even work with companies. We've had to walk away from some of the biggest and best companies in America because by not getting this in place, you couldn't get anything done. 
It was just all smoke and mirrors. So here's the bottom line. You know, as a mathematician, here's the numbers. We look at 1,000 people, we find 30% of them are doing stuff that nobody wants them to be doing. And in software, this is particularly bad because you get all this useless code in the system, 30% of it is totally useless, and 30% of all your bugs for the rest of your life until you retire is generated by this useless code. <laughs> I used to... You know, I've been CTO or head of engineering or CEO of 11 companies. In my last few companies, I would say, I would rather have you guys take the day off and go surfing than write useless code. I don't want to maintain it for the next 20 years. And uh, I remember the last company, it was the policy. That the product owner team did not have a clear backlog. Coming into sprint planning, the whole development organization was to take the day off and go surfing. When they produce the code, only 35% of it is regularly used. Actually, at Adobe, they did an analysis, only 5% at Adobe. <laughs> they stopped building that 95% of junk. And then if you look at process efficiency, which is what we really train our scrum masters in, to really understand how lean thinking Process efficiency, does anybody in here know the process efficiency of your scrum team? You can get that. How many are using JIRA? Okay, you can get it from JIRA. What you want to know is if something should, if a story should take a day, an ideal day to get done, how many calendar days does it take to be moved to done in JIRA? If one day of work takes five calendar days to get done, one over five is 20 percent. That's the lean process efficiency metric. At GE, we actually had guys that knew what the process efficiency of their scrum team were because these guys understood lean, and it was five percent. So 15 percent is probably high for many of you. So if you multiply these three together, 3.7% effectiveness is a typical organization. It's kind of like your brain. You know, we used to say only, 10, only using 10% of our brain. But now the latest research with all these PET scans and everything, they found out it's much less than 10%. It's about 3.7%. <laughs> the good news is that if you really understand this, you can fix it. Let me, let me just show you. Who is responsible for making sure people are working on the right thing? Yeah, well, it's the product owners, but what we find is that is the management and the leadership are interfering with the backlog. They're pulling people off of projects, creating new projects. They're jacking around the organizations. So the product owners alone can't fix this. We need the management to agree to put a product owner organization in place and agree to support their backlog. Otherwise, you're going to have this. Now, to get the right features out there, now here's where the product owner has to shine to, 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 to stop doing these useless features. And the scrum masters need to improve the process efficiency of the team. So <clears throat> I was at a startup in uh, Massachusetts, actually a big startup, at least 300 developers hiring 200 more. Now there are six or 700 developers selling cloud infrastructure. They got, uh, today people are bringing in mainly to train management. The agile coach for the organization said, Jeff, I want you to come in and do scrum master training and product owner training, but you're only gonna have managers. So we get the managers of the room for two days and we really work these issues. And they walk out of there and here's what happens. Here's one team. The team's running, this is a scrum team running at a velocity of 10. They immediately stabilize the team. And they stop messing with the backlog. Velocity shoots up to 60, 600% increase, just by the management supporting 
the product owner's backlog. Then the team starts doing some process improvement. Here they start introducing the patterns, which I don't have time to talk about, that we do at training. In five three-week sprints, they've gone from a velocity of 10 to a velocity of 165. When they dropped off here, root cause analysis showed a manager had come in and cut a secret deal with a developer to work off backlog. When people found out they were furious, they got it fixed. Meanwhile, in the same time frame, the Agile coach is, is ramping 10 more teams just like this. I had told them to stop hiring. I said, I will give you 200 developers without you hiring a single person. And in five three-week sprints, we did better than that because if 10 teams go five times as fast, you're effectively getting 40 free teams times seven. Their teams are about seven, 280 people. <clears throat> this is called scaling, Scrum Inc. scaling. We start by scaling the velocity, <clears throat> and then we replicate that across the organization. That way, you get radical performance. <clears throat> Most scaling frameworks come in and scale a mess. They scale this. Let's get everybody in the corporation running at a velocity of 10. And now we've got 100 teams running at a velocity of 10. By then, they call in Scrum Inc. to fix it. And I'm tired of fixing this stuff. So we're really trying to get people not to do Scrum until they get some focus. It's a lot easier to get it right in the beginning. So <clears throat> this process was formalized based on Professor Takeshi Tanaka's paper, The New New Product Development Game. They had this chart in the paper of three types of project management. This is what they saw at NASA. It's how they build the space shuttle. It's how they're building the F-35. $200 billion over budget, no end in sight. <clears throat> this is how they build the Saab Gripen. Two-week sprints, 20% of the cost, both initial purchase and life cycle cost. And every six months, they do a new release. And every new release is faster, lighter, cheaper, just like your laptop, right? You expect your laptop to be faster and cost less when you buy a new one. That's the way it should be for everything. If it's done with Scrum, that's the way it will be. They also said that <coughs> the Scrum teams, what they call Scrum Project Management, <coughs> we found in talking to the lean guys, they were looking at lean product development at places like Toyota and Honda. <coughs> they all had these characteristics, transcendent goals, Autonomous teams, the teams figured out what to do, how much to do, how to do it, and cross-fertilization, cross-functionality, fundamental. So <clears throat> now, fast forward to 2001, we get together. It's mainly Scrum, the founders of Scrum and the founders of XP, plus a bunch of consultants. And we're debating about what we're doing. All this other agile stuff people are talking about didn't exist. Okay. We argued and debated for a day what we would call what we're doing. And at the end of the day, we agreed. We had a lot of candidates, but we agreed on agile because of this book, which is on 100 hardware companies that said they were lean and they were using the word agile to describe bringing the customer into the product development and participating in product development. So this is what Agile is. And <clears throat> what Toyota is finding out, as I mentioned earlier, is you know, the Tesla is teaching them. You know, they told me what, when I was at Toyota headquarters, they said, we've learned that we have to put the fun back in driving. And they said, come on out and try out our new hydrogen-powered vehicle. Toyota Marais. And we went out, I went out and I drove it with the CIO. And, it was a lot more fun than the Prius. <laughs> Toyota has 10 worldwide corporate initiatives this year, and one of them is get agile, everybody. 
globally get agile. <clears throat> and it requires major changes at Toyota to get agile because agile is more than lean. It's, it's involving the customer in the product creation. And here's the data, <clears throat> a little bit of the data on actually the budget is bigger than this for the F-35 now. This is the Scrum airplane. Aviation Week says the best airplane in the world. Jane's Aviation Weekly says the cheapest air airplane in the world. So Scrum is spreading everywhere. <clears throat> As I said, we're doing a lot of work with hardware. Joe Justice leads our hardware practice. Here he is at the University of Delft where they're working on <coughs> uh, solar and hydrogen powered vehicles. But it's spreading in all different domains. I, I was at PayPal recently and I asked how many people at PayPal had run their weddings by Scrum and seven people raised their hand. <laughs> Anybody run your wedding by Scrum here? Yeah, one, we got one. Works really good for weddings. The most interesting one to me, though, and I had some, uh, uh, a couple of my German partners over for the last three weeks, and the woman is responsible for Edge of Scrum in Germany. Edge of Scrum is the leading implementation of Scrum for education. <clears throat> it started in the Netherlands, uh, again, driven by a black belt Aikido teacher, who also happened to be a chemistry teacher. And he had the kids work in teams of four. The bell rings, they come running in, they go to the wall, put their scrum board up, have a daily meeting, they run to the desk and start working. The teacher's just standing there watching. I asked the teacher, you know, what do you do? She said, well, I'm the product owner. I, I give them the backlog. They figure it out. If they have questions, they ask me. She says, they, ne let me, they never let me talk more than 10 minutes. It really focuses the team. They really self-manage. I mean, they plan the work they do. They'll work right through vacations trying to get their work done. And everything is visible. Virtually all motivation and disciplinary problems go away. The team self-manages. And the kids say, it's a lot more fun. They said, they couldn't believe that I didn't invent this for teenagers. That was actually, we were using it for adults. They said it's <laughs> perfect for teenagers. And their grades are a lot better. These are the same uh, Netherlands scales on uh, grades on one to 10. These are the same classes, waterfall versus scrum. And this last semester, the scrum classes finished the semester six weeks early. It takes them about a week one to two weeks just to boot up the scrum, so it costs them on the front end, and they still wind up finishing the semester six weeks early with grades that are about 20% higher. So <clears throat> going back to the World Bank, it's another thing I learned by looking at the data. Here's the global population. And here's their measurement of global poverty. And, you know, lean did not fix global poverty. Where it started to go down was the first microcomputer. It's, it's the computation. <clears throat> when I was in India earlier this year, my wife wanted to go on a two week trip on a riverboat up the Ganges River, stopping in all these little villages, the poorest villages in India. Everywhere, they had TVs and cell phones. They took more pictures of me with their smartphones than I took of them. And there's an Indian startup that's selling smartphones for $4. Okay. So instead of 600 bucks, it's four bucks. So that's, the, that's what's happening in the, in the poorest villages in India. And it's driving poverty down. <clears throat> the Grameen Bank, where, which actually helped us through Oxyone really think about this, uh, they have a foundation now that's using Scrum for everything they do. We've actually done Scrum training for them. And they had this great video of a, uh, their agricultural headquarters is in Uganda. And they had a woman 
standing in the field with her baby, saying, OK, the Green Bank came in with their scrum team and their scrum application, applications on their iPhone. And they showed me that some of the leaves on my crop were yellow, and they showed me how to fix that. Now I have twice as many bushels per acre. They also showed me on the iPhone that the price of my crops in the cities was 1,000 shillings a bushel, and I was only getting 300. So I negotiated up to 600 shillings a bushel with my middleman. So now I'm getting twice as much money per bushel, and I have twice as many bushels. I have 400% more revenue. Now, if a poor dirt farmer in Uganda could use Scrum to raise revenue 400%, Every person in this room can do it. But you've got to get twice the work done in half the time. <laughs> and that's my message for tonight. <laughs> do we have any time for questions? Or? Start the question. We've got microphones in the audience, and we'll bring them to you so the folks online can hear the question. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, you mentioned 4.6 as the average for optimal team size. Uh, is that a number or a pattern that you see is repeated in other situations, other contexts, other, other areas of nature? I mean, is that a magic number in some way? <clears throat> I don't know if it's a magic number in nature, but I, we have done a lot of experimentation at Scrum Inc. among our own teams. And what we clearly see is that if there's four or five people that are in a group trying to come to a decision, it goes quickly. As soon as you get six, there's a little slowdown. Seven is noticeable slowdown. Eight, it starts to become painful. And that's why at nine, we say we have to split. So we've observed that in the inner. So it's, it's the communication pattern. So Everybody doesn't get a chance to talk. All the information can't get on the table. There's not enough time, all these kind of things. So that phenomenon, I'm sure, occurs elsewhere in, in nature. Probably at the cellular level, there's these kind of mechanisms that are going on. I don't know, but I haven't really studied that. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, great talk. I just want to understand more what the correlation in your Scrum Master, I guess, with their martial art background and the team's productivity. Uh, is it something that's specific to martial art that can be translated into business with people with no martial art background? Thank you. Okay, so one of the things that I've been doing, let's see if I can find uh, the uh, a slide that I can show you is I realize we got to do a lot more training of leadership in what I'm calling the agile mindset. And, uh, and in this, particularly in the product order course, we, we, we do that. And let, let me just show you one slide that kind of illustrates it. If I can get this thing to come up. I had a dream one night, and in the dream, this commanding general with shoulders like about four feet across kind of drops through the ceiling, and he has this, uh, these leathers on with these uh, uh, silver rings hanging and a sword in his hand. And he comes dropping through the ceiling, right side of my bed, whoom. And he said, you've got to train them in the agile mindset. And he goes, whack, with his sword. I mean, I sat up bolt upright in my bed. It's the only dream I ever had where I woke up immediately and sat up bolt upright. So I said, OK, <laughs> I get it. Uh, so here's a slide that, that illustrates that. 
Here are uh, four of my mentors. Sun Tzu, a famous Chinese general, he was able to win a battle without ever firing a shot. Now, this is really important for how many agile coaches do we have in here? You have to learn how to transform that organization without shooting anybody. <laughs> and it is not going to be easy. Because I have found fairly consistency. You go into a large organization, about a third of the people, they want to rock and roll. Another third, they're willing to try it. But a third of them are like, not on my watch. And they're going to try to take you down as an agile coach. So you're going to have to win against the naysayers. And if you can do it without firing a shot, it's, that's the best way. Yeah. Just um, two questions. One is a follow-up on the team side. So the 4.6, is that supposed to include product owners and your scrum master? And Actually, we community? found by doing experiments over and over again, it's the people doing the work deciding how they're going to do the work. And, 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 and so it's the people that have to make the decisions that are hands-on. In our company, we have scrum masters and product owners are also working on backlog. So they are you know, team members as well. And so they count in that environment. If, they're, if the product owner is not working directly on the team, we're burning backlog. If the scrum master is a full-time coach and not actually, then maybe, maybe 6.6 is OK. And then on your slide with the velocity, um, I'm just curious because you, you talked about how the team wasn't working on the right things. But wouldn't the velocity still be potentially high, just not on things that the customer wanted? I mean, how did the, the velocity go from being so low to? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, people rightfully point out that if you're going fast building the wrong thing, that's not good. Yeah. But I work with a venture capital firm. We have about a billion dollars invested in uh, dozens of companies. <clears throat> And we find if they're slow, it doesn't matter how good the backlog is. So, so the first thing we need to do is get them to go fast. And that takes about 20% of our effort initially. And then we spend 80% of our time working with the product owners and the management to try to get the product right through the market segmentation, get the product owner's organization, uh, test the product in the market. That's, that is actually harder than getting the engineering going fast. I have lots of other questions, but I'll let other people go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I do want to, let's see, do I have, um, I, don't, I don't have uh, the picture in this deck, but sometimes the women complain that they're all male figures. That's because I was a cadet at West Point, and we didn't have any women there at the time. But uh, my son, JJ, who is a co-author of the book and lives here in Washington, has two little girls, and he's got a shot of a three-year-old with a, a kind of a Darth Vader helmet, and she looks exactly like Musashi. She's got the short sword and the long sword. So it has nothing to do with sex. It has to do with being able to win the battle for agility. <laughs> uh, so I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Convenient that I have a mic. Um, in your book, you talk about a happiness factor as a pre-indicator of a drop-off in productivity of your scrum team. Is that still, is that still something you're using? Uh, definitely, you know, back in, uh, in uh, oh, it's over five years ago now, and I'll show you the, the data where we started off on this. If I can put my finger on it, I came back from. Uh, from Europe, and I've been working with Crisp, Hendrik Nieberg at Crisp, and they were using the ha happiness metric to, to drive uh, revenue for the company. They said it's a better forward indicator of revenue than any other metric. And uh, so when I get back to the company, we're, we're booting up a new scrum team, and I said, let's, let's use the happiness metric and see if, see if we can 
see if that helps us. And this was back at the end of 2010. And the team was running at a velocity of 40. And so I, I said, okay, we're going to use this to boot up the retrospective better. And we're going to do it by asking people how, they, how happy they are about their job. But even more important than the number on a scale of one to five, what would make them happier in the next sprint? And then when we get all the things that will make everybody happier, we're going to discuss what is the one thing that will make the team most happy. And we started here, and uh, here they said, we want new space. So I said, OK, get a contract, a new space. So here they we were moving to a new building. Then user stories became the number one thing on happiness. Velocity went from 40 to 70. User stories were still at the top at the end of the next sprint, went to 100. User stories were still at the top, went to 300. You can get a 300% improvement gain just by better user stories. Then it gets harder. This is raw velocity, so here's a lot of summer vacation. Here's where we're closed down between Christmas and New Year's. But look at that. We're clo we closed the company Christmas and New Year's. The velocity closed was the same as it used to be when we were open. <laughs> and velocity will go up and down, but you can see the trend line. So this is the end of 2013. So at the end of 2015, what was our velocity? Just draw the line. 350. That's what it was. Then we hired, we increased the company size by 50%. And a couple of people were great scrum masters, including the Tai Chi master. And the company size went up 30%. I, the velocity should have gone to 500 if there was a linear increase, but it didn't. It went to 1,200. <clears throat> so getting great people can have a really significant impact as well. Dr. Sutherland, thank you so much for sharing those data. Impressive. And I just have a question about, about 10 years ago, I somewhere studied like, uh, people in the IT industry uh, using Scrum about 35%. And we know Scrum is one of the uh, agile methods. And as of today, I don't know, did I miss anything? That I, do we have any data show how many people, population using Scrum as, as of today? The, the surveys that show <clears throat> Somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of what people are calling Agile is Scrum. <clears throat> and in my mind, there's still really only two Agile methods, Scrum and XP, that work. And the best teams today use them together, like the first Scrum team. And uh, I think the only significant thing that's been added to the mix is getting continuous deployment working. So pulling operations into the team. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for your talk. Uh, you mentioned that you walked away from several successful companies that did not have an executive action uh, right. team. What, what do you look for in that, especially if you're in a consulting role where you have senior management for your company and then, say, senior management for the client who may be resistant well, to that change? We, we spent a lot of team, time and we actually burned a lot of coaching dollars, more than we should have. You know, we're learning to cut this off more quickly. Telling them what needed to be done, trying to coach the leadership that, you know, if you don't do these certain things at the leadership level, we're, we're never going to get the kind of motion you want. And our goal is to always at least double the performance of every team. And the best teams will get 8 to 10. So if we can't do that, we feel like we're just going to look bad. So it it's doesn't make sense for us to, to stay around. Also. The company's wasting a lot of money. I was in Silicon Valley when I was doing the book tour, and every consultant in Silicon Valley has Agile on their business cards. And some of these biggest companies, like Cisco, had hundreds of Agile coaches. 
and hundreds of scrum masters, and 80% of the teams had no working software at the end of a sprint. I said, you guys are wasting your money on all these coaches and scrum masters. Why are you paying them? And two of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley said, we're going to stop. We're going to have internal coaching, training, and we're going to build internally people that actually can help teams improve and really be worth the money we're spending on it. So. Uh, Dr. Sutherland, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, my question is, um, uh, like the Edu Scrum that you showed, are there any organizations uh, in the U.S. which are doing uh, something for Scrum in the non-IT, non-technical space? Oh, yeah, there are lots of companies. Uh, there's even in Boston, there's an Edu Scrum startup just working in education. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we have case studies on Scrum and sales. You know, a sales team can double their revenue in six months using Scrum. Um, today, I was, a, I was with a whole group of leaders in digital marketing here in Washington, working both in the government and within commercial firms. We had uh, Branson's guy from Virgin Airlines here. He said, Branson's probably going to be calling you because uh, says a lot of our projects could really be amped up if we were using this kind of approach. My wife was a Unitarian Universalist minister, and for 20 years I was helping her implement Scrum in the churches. I would go in, she'd bring me in, we'd do some training. You know, in the churches they're always short of money, they're always fighting over the budget. And so I said to them, okay, here's a way that you can do twice as much programming community service, deep in the spirituality of the people, whatever it is, for half your current budget. And I showed them how to do it. And then I asked them the question. If you were a religious person and you knew you could do twice as much value creation in your community for half the amount of money that you're spending, and you didn't do that, wouldn't that be a religious issue? <laughs> and we, we, we kept on going after that. But it turns out that it's just as hard for people that are well-meaning, and I've spent 25 years in healthcare, we find the same thing. There's a lot of well-meaning people in healthcare that want to help people. There's a lot of well-meaning people in churches that want to help people. But to get them to practice the discipline that will actually enable them to help that is a huge struggle. <laughs> and you really need to work at, at, uh, at, at, I would say, at a spiritual level with these people. Okay? You will never be a person who can make a major contributor to humanity unless you develop the skill set to execute the value delivery at far less cost than you're spending right now. And so, that is a really important, as much as loving people is important, if you can't execute, the love is not going to help you. Yes. Thank you. Maybe Jesus was a scrum master, right? <laughs> <laughs> he was always giving people a hard time, you know. That's the job of a scrum master, is give people a hard time, right? <laughs> I have a question. Um, are there any plans to um, translating the book into Spanish? And it's already done. It's already done? Okay. I there is a Spanish that. edition, yes. Okay, good. And also, um, uh, can you tell us anything about any work in Latin America you've been doing? Or? Uh, we, uh, my son and, and our, his wife is now our new director of marketing. As, uh, she's a Latino and she's worked for many years in the big telecoms in uh, marketing in the Spanish American community. And so, They've been down in the Dominican Republic and Colombia uh, doing training together. There are also a lot of other trainers down there that, that do work down there. Mike Beadle, who was really one of the first guys in Scrum, he actually grew up in Chile. So he does a lot of training in, um, in Latin America. Great, thank you. Hi. 
Thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. Um, I actually had a question regarding transitioning from traditional waterfall methods in proposal writing into a more agile method. So I work at an advertising agency. One of the really um, just barriers that were really difficult barriers that we're running into is that a lot of times clients want very specific deliverables outlined in a proposal. And then when we try to transition them to a more like agile method, we're like, oh, well, we'll give you these completed pieces and parts. Um, from a proposal standpoint, we're getting a lot of pushback from contracting offices. What's kind of a happy medium as to still give them some really hard deliverables, but also be able to work in the framework of Agile? Right. The, uh, we had the same problem we were doing the book. We wanted the Random House editors to scrum along with us, because the book was all scrummed. Uh, <clears throat> But here's the, here's the thing we found in big companies doing big government contracts where they want, you know, it's an RFP, they need the total bid done up front. They find that using agile techniques, they can prepare these huge estimates at 20% of the cost. So it doesn't matter whether it's building an airplane or making a proposal. 20% of the cost is the norm for a well-executed scrum. And, and they can complete the project for half the price. So the way that uh, the, this big consultancy now, which is thousands of people, is totally scrum from top to bottom, including the senior management team, the way they converted all their customers, they said, OK, we're going to give every customer two bids, $10 million for the waterfall version, $5 million for the scrum version. The only difference between the two projects is that Scrum version has consistently 40% fewer defects, plus or minus 3%. So higher quality work. But in order to get it, we need you as the customer to participate at regular intervals with us. And so the contract says you must do that, or it reverts to the waterfall version, which costs twice as much. So customer, you can sign whichever contract you want. What do you think the customers did? They all wanted half price. What do you think happened to the revenue of the company when they did everything half price? It doubled. That means they were doing four times as many projects. What do you think was happening to their competition? They were doing a lot fewer projects. Right? So you know, the way to incent the customers is show them they can get more value if they work in this way at a lower cost, yeah. yeah let me ask you, is, <clears throat> excuse me, a similar question. With federal acquisition regulations, the FARs, where the contracting officers have to follow the, the regulations and they have to have the requirements up front, how do you implement an agile approach? I understand we start with the delivery, but when a company wants to say, I'm going to respond to this, but by the way, the contracting officer says, you have to do those requirements so that the requirements have to be defined up front, but the companies have to deliver to that far, and they would like to use your approach because you will save time and money. Right. <clears throat> okay, so several years ago, in a defense budget, a congressional staff member put in that all DOD IT contracts must be agile. That's the law. The Pentagon then set up cross service task force in 12 different domains. And then the head of IT for DOD, who had come to my Scrum Master training, said, Jeff, I want you to come in and brief the task force. So I come down here to the Pentagon. We meet in the morning. I got the chairs of all the cross service task force in the room. They say to me, We don't make anything around here. We just buy guns. How is Agile going to help us buy guns? So I went through, you know, we spent an hour or so explaining how Scrum works. And I said, okay, so I said, here's the first thing that you need to do as the purchases of the guns. Right now, you put out a bid. Every Beltway Bandit is coming in, lowballing the bid. Maybe even some people here at MITRE. 
trying to get that contract. And they know they're not going to make a lot of money in that contract, on the initial bid, but when you ask for changes, they're going to charge you a lot of money. So their goal is to have as many change requests as possible so that the project takes as long as possible and has the biggest cost overrun as possible because that's where they make all their money. I said, they're going to bleed you dry. And every person at that table said, yes, that is our problem. I said, well, here's the first simple agile thing you do that will stop this immediately. You put in every contract a paragraph that says, all changes are for free. And if they, you want to change in there, all you have to do is throw away one of these low priority features, because 65% of them are useless anyway. <laughs> and it doesn't take any more work. You come in on time and on budget, and they can't bleed you. So they said, well, that's going to be really hard. We may have to change the regulations. Might even have to change the law. And I said, well, you've got a multi-trillion dollar budget, which is more than most countries. You guys sitting at this table, if you can't figure it out, nobody can. Fast forward. Three years later, one of our biggest defense contractors comes to me in Massachusetts and says, we just lost a $400 million radar contract to a scrum bid from Lockheed. We've had to lay hundreds of people off. And the government has told us we will never get another contract unless it's half price. We are going to have to do the scrum that generates twice the work in half the time, or we're going to be out of business. So I said to myself, those guys at the Pentagon, they figured it out. They're not paying more than half price for anything anymore. And if you look at the government regulations, I, I've got all the links on my blog. They've all been changed. The Agile Manifesto is embedded in the DOD IT regulations. The Agile Manifesto is written into it. You must do this. So now you have these, all these agencies that have been waterfall forever, and we're having trouble turning the battleship. We might have to send some people to jail along the way. Uh, and, but they will change. I can tell you our Massachusetts defense contractors spent two years negotiating earned value in points burning up so that they could submit an agile contract. And for those of you who are Agile coaches, the way it has worked is they got paid for partially completing a task. So if they did half a task, they would get paid. What is that going to, everybody that knows Scrum knows what that's going to do to the budget. What's it going to do? They're multitasking, mammoth multitasking. It's going, to create, it's going to cut 80%. If you look at the data in software on projects, you know that's going to cut 80% of the production out of the system just by the massive multitasking by paying people for partial completion of thousands of tasks. So when the defense contractor that earned value and points burn up, nothing is paid for unless it meets the definition of done. That's going to save the taxpayer huge amounts of money. Okay, so all of these things, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what Agile can do to fix these projects. And, and read, the, read the book, the FBI project, just like Obamacare. $400 million, hundreds of people for years, nothing worked. The FBI put 30 Agile people in the basement of the FBI building. A year and a half later, for less than the remaining budget, you know, maybe 10% of the original budget, they brought that project in on time, and now they're able to track terrorists. 
10 years after 9-11, we couldn't track a terrorist because we're using this waterfall thing on a government project. This is still going on over in healthcare, maybe at the IRS. I think Social Security is more agile, Immigration Service is very agile. We still got parts of our government that is totally wasting billions and billions of dollars, not getting anything done. It's, as a taxpayer, I am outraged. I, I wish you all would be outraged with me and do what that congressional staff person did. You know, get to the person that can put in the next bill, Agile is the law of the land. Yeah. You said that when you added two great scrum masters, your velocity went from like 500 to 1,200. Can you please describe quickly like the qualities of a great scrum master? Well, the scrum master are always asking me, how will I know they're a good scrum master? I would, and I always say, well, the team is happy and getting happier, and the velocity is high and getting higher. So, you know, one of the scrum masters we hired, as I said, was the, the U.S. champion, probably, probably the world champion, Tai Chi master for many years. In fact, they forced him into retirement. They say, nobody, could, nobody can win against you. You're demotivating all the young people. And we put him in charge of the senior coaching team, which I'm on. Well, he is just really good at taking no nonsense for anybody. He, he, he is a master. He's just not just somebody that's designated as a scrum master. So, you know, it's like, he's like, let's get going. He has like the energy. And, you know, if people are wasting time or mouthing off, he's like, Let, let's knock that off. And, and for somehow he can just wave his hand and it goes away. He, he's got power. Okay, so all, a lot of the nonsense just evaporates. The other person we hired was actually a person that worked at Random House. And when we did a book tour in London, she did more meetings in two days than Random House New York did with us in two years. And every hour, the taxi showed up with a cup of coffee, and we walked into the next meeting, and it was with people like the leading guy in BBC that has interviewed every American president for the last 20 years. We show up and we get these great interviews. And after two days of that, I said, we got to hire this woman as a scrum master. She is more organized and efficient than anybody we've ever seen. And it took us a year to recruit her to get her to come to Boston. But right now, she has actually the best team, even better than the Tai Chi guy. She's just so good. So you don't need superheroes. You know, you saw our velocity just went up nicely with just regular scrum masters. They're struggling scrum masters. But then we threw a couple of superstars in there, and whoa, <laughs> you know, it kind of <laughs> raised the whole bar. But now they're struggling to keep it going up from that higher level. We just, uh, that, that scrum master from Random House wants to go out and do coaching and training. And so we want her to do that, but we need a new scrum master. We just put out, uh, uh, we were talking about hiring earlier. We are hiring a new scrum master. Unfortunately, there are already 50 experienced scrum masters who immediately sent their resume in. <laughs> we're, we're trying to interview them all in these weeks as we're going. But we'll, I'm sure we're going to find a good one out of those people that, have, that really want to be a scrum master. It's a great opportunity for someone to really work with people who know this stuff. All right, excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let's hear it. Okay.